In the book of Proverbs, we read that there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. In Romans 9 through 11, particularly in chapter 11, we see how the nation of Israel has rejected God's provision. Not only the Messiah, but the Savior. And yet in the wisdom of God, he has found a way that through their unbelief, he might reach out to them in mercy. Our scripture reading went back to the beginning of this subunit, back to verse 11. The message today picks up at verse 16, but I wanted to remind you of the previous section, the previous verses. Because I think in a lot of ways, Romans 11, 11 to the end of the chapter, is kind of the crescendo, the climax of the book. It ends with a doxology of the infinite goodness and wisdom of God. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. A lot of people focus wrongly on the intent of the passage. They miss the fact that this passage reeks of grace and mercy. Rather, they want to look at it through the lens of condemnation. They want to read it in a sense that God has cut off Israel almost as though he is punishing them in such a way that no Jews can possibly be saved. They are now outside of the grace of God. And this passage is not teaching that at all. In fact, it's teaching the opposite. It's teaching that in the midst of their rejection, God is going to perform his acts in such a way that even more of them are going to be saved. Notice the thought line. Paul had earlier asked the question, Israel has rejected God, therefore has God rejected his people? And he says, by no means, God forbid. God has not cut off, he has not rejected Israel. In chapter 9, Paul said that the covenant promises and all those blessings were still theirs. So what changed? Simply that they rejected God's provision. So then what was God going to do? Was God going to cast them aside? No. What God was going to do is turn to the Gentiles for what reason? Well, number one, that Gentiles would be saved. Now there's a sub-reason for this. Remember, in the Old Testament, Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. They were supposed to evangelize the pagan nations around them. They were supposed to go to the Gentiles and make God known. And they didn't do it. They kept him for themselves. Not only that, they chased after the pagan gods. They didn't want the Gentiles to be saved. Remember the story of Jonah? Jonah is mad that God is merciful. I knew you would do that. I knew you'd forgive them. And he sulks over the grace and mercy of God. Israel was set apart by God not to be blessed in and of themselves, but to go and bless others. By the way, you see the parallel with the modern church? We're not supposed to hide our lamp under a bowl, but to shine it brightly. We're supposed to go into all the world and make disciples. We're supposed to share the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. We're to share 
the mercy of salvation. We are to be a light to this world that others would know God and be saved. But Israel wouldn't do it. Not only did they not fulfill their mandate of being a light to the nations, but they themselves rejected God's predicted provision for the problem of sin. God had prophesied throughout the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah 53, exactly what he was going to do, that he was going to lay on on the the Messiah, he was going to lay on this one who is God, the iniquity of us all. And yet they would not believe. And so what is God going to do? God is going to find a way that the light would go to the nations. The apostles and the disciples and the followers of Jesus Christ were going to go and they were going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would believe and be saved. But God was going to do this in such a way that the Jews themselves would be jealous. And this is one of those light switch moments, one of these kaboom moments where your your attention should be grabbed by what God is doing here. Because everybody thinks that either the gospel's wrong or, or there's something going on or God has cast them aside, but no. God, in spite of their rejection, is still going to minister to them and he's going to save them. And through the rejection, even more people are going to be saved because the Gentiles are going to be saved. And then the climax comes when he says, and all Israel will be saved. No wonder Paul then cries out in verse 33 about the unfathomable riches and wisdom of God. God used their rejection in order that people might be saved. Remember, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And God is saving souls. He didn't cast off Israel. Paul says, look at me. I'm an example that God hasn't done it. What were the the original apostles? They were Jews. The gospel began in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. On the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people were saved, it's Jews who are saved. God didn't make it so they can't believe. They won't believe, Paul says, because they won't put their faith in Christ. Everything that is happening to them is because they will not believe believe but one day they will we are told that one day they will look on the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn and weep over him and they will believe so this isn't God's fault it's not the gospel's fault The fault is an unbelieving heart. If you ask why anybody is not saved, the answer is always the same. An unbelieving heart. John 3, verse 18, says that the wrath of God abides on them. Why? Because they will not believe in God's one and only Son. Israel will not not believe. And so what did God do? Well, he found a way to get them to believe. Not by forcing them to against their free will, but by saving and blessing the Gentiles. And the Jews are like, hey, we want that. Here's another side note for the church. When the world looks at your life, are they jealous for it? Do they see something in you that draws them to you and draws them to Christ? I understand scripture says that to those who are perishing, that our life is like a stench. But there's that other side of the coin where somebody sees you and they see what you love and what you live for and how you, 
how you put up under s- difficult circumstances and how you just unwaveringly trust in the Lord and they're drawn to that. Is that true of you in your life? Are people drawn to, to the Lord because they see him at work in your life and they say, I want that. I want that peace that surpasses understanding. I want that joy of the Lord that you have that even when you know all hope seems to be gone and you've lost this, you, you still have joy in your heart. Do we provoke people to jealousy? I want that intangible that you have. So Paul in verses 11 through 15 talks about what God is going to do. He says that salvation has come to the Gentiles, verse 11, to make the Jews jealous. You see, they thought all the blessings were there and none of them were to the, gen- to the Gentiles. All the blessings were ours, the Jews thought. In fact, they thought that God hated the Gentiles. But now, those things that they took for granted are now being bestowed upon the Gentiles. And God is using it to move them to jealousy. And it's a jealousy in the context that is not God holding a carrot out that they cannot reach or ever attain, but one that they can have if they would believe as the Gentiles believed. Remember he says that the Jews are pursuing it by the law, but couldn't attain it? But the Gentiles who weren't pursuing it did attain it because of faith. You want what the Gentiles have? Well, you get it the same way. Faith which was his whole theological argument in the first three chapters especially, but really up till the end of chapter 8. Salvation by faith alone, through grace alone, apart from works. Remember he said, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by faith. So he says in verse uh, 12, now if their transgression is riches for the world, that is the benefit of their transgression is that these Gentiles are be saved. That's riches for the world, right? The gospel's going everywhere. The book of Acts, it ends up right in the heart of the capital of the world, in Rome. So the gospel is spreading like wildfire throughout the world. The Jews were just boxing it in which is what the church often does. You know, the gospel is for Sundays when we come to church. We preach the gospel to each other. But we don't go from here and go forth into the world and share the gospel with our loved ones, with our neighbors, with our co-workers, with strangers. And Paul says... The riches of the world with their failure, the riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their fullness be? In other words, when the Jews finally believe and they start doing what they're supposed to be doing, then you want to see revival. And this is going to happen in part during the tribulation. The, the, the statement that when they will turn on him who they pierce happens right at the end of the tribulation period. But during the whole seven-year tribulation period, the Jews are bringing the gospel to the world. God starts off the tribulation period by setting aside 144,000 Jews that are going to be evangelists proclaiming the gospel, not just to other Jews. The greatest revival in history is going to come during the greatest persecution in history during that time. But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save them. So Paul is saying, not, not that he's only saving Gentiles in, other, in the hopes that it's gonna, some Jews are going to get je- jealous and be saved, but it's an added motivation for Paul. Paul's thinking, the more Gentiles that I reach with the gospel, the more that are going to be saved. That's great. That's the best news. But he sees a cherry on the top. He says, and an additional motivation is that them being saved is going to provoke my fellow Jews 
to greater jealousy, and then they may be saved. So Paul sees a win-win. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Paul contrasts what's going to happen as a resurrection. And we know this, right? Because didn't, didn't Ezekiel describe the, the spiritual rebirth of Israel in the valley of dry bones? That when the Spirit of God was blown on them, they came to life. Israel turning in faith really is the miraculous outpouring of the Spirit. Now, in verse 16, he's going to pick up with two illustrations to describe what's going on. And he's going to give these illustrations in some ways because some of the Gentiles were thinking that Israel rejected God, God rejected Israel, it's all about us now. We're the favored ones, they're the outcasts. And we know from church history, even back to the very beginning, that there was a lot of anti-Semitism that broke out among the Gentile believers on the Jews. They thought that because, in their view, God had rejected them, that they should be mocked for it. Rather than having pity and being gracious and merciful to them, many of them mocked them and treated them as they were getting what they deserved. And we know how the history of this works. This has worked out even into modern times where even many Christians wrongly believe that Jews should be persecuted and all the things that have happened to them out throughout history, they deserve it because they killed the Messiah. Not recognizing that the Bible says over and over and over again that it was God the Father who handed him over to be crucified. And Jesus himself, the scriptures say, could have called down legions of angels to deliver him from the cross. Jesus also said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord only to take it up again. Jesus let it happen to him. So in verse 16, it says, and if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. Now, this is drawn from Numbers chapter 15. So if you want to turn there for a second, Numbers chapter 15. Now, I'm not going to identify the, the parts yet because uh, the two illustrations, the second one has to do with an olive tree and branches, that they, the, the parallel between the, the first lump of dough and the root seem to be uh, parallel here. So to interpret one is to interpret the other. But in Numbers chapter 15, we have something that's part of the Mosaic law that uh, would come into effect when they entered into the promised land. So they're in the wilderness, and this is what they were told to do. When they entered into the promised land, they began to grow their own crops. And so in Numbers 15, beginning at verse 17, it says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land where I am going to bring you, then it shall be when you eat of the food of the land, you shall raise up a contribution offering to Yahweh. Of the first of your dough, you shall raise up a cake as a contribution offering. As the contribution offering uh, of the threshing floor, so you shall raise it up. From the first of your dough, you shall give to Yahweh a contribution offering throughout your generations. Now, there's a couple of interpretations on what this, this means. Some think that it was only once a year that when the harvest, the beginning of the harvest would come in, that they would offer up this small bit of the first uh, as an offering to God. They would set it apart. Others think that, and this became uh, part of Judaism as it developed, that every time you would bake bread, you would set apart a small part for God. Okay, so you would consecrate. This was the first fruits of it. Now, if you were listening closely, Paul adds something to this. 
because he talks in Romans about it being made holy. It doesn't mention that in the context. Now, in Numbers 15, what he's telling them is that when you go, you're going to take a small part of this dough and you're going to make it into a cake. And normally what happened is these were, were given for the priests. So this was the first allotment. And it was set apart with the anticipation of more coming. That's the whole idea of first fruits, right? So the, when they had the, the feast of first fruits, they were to offer the first fruits. And this happened twice because there was two harvests. They had, the first one was the barley harvest, which came in first. And they would offer in barley, which was unleavened. It, it has uh, uh, higher gluten content, and so it's different characteristics than wheat that would come in later. So you would have the first fruits from the barley harvest and then the first fruits from, from the wheat harvest. And it's like if you were growing corn and the first you know, cob that comes up, you offer that to the Lord on the assumption that you dedicate it, you hand it back to God, and in that transaction, so to speak, you're trusting in God that he's going to bring in the harvest for you. So it's giving God first and trusting him with the rest. And there's wonderful applications for this. For instance, if you're, you're setting a budget, who do you pay first? God. Okay, you don't give God from your leftovers. You give him the first fruits and then you trust him with the rest to provide for the rest. If you're giving God the leftovers, there's no trust involved. There's no faith involved. And this has to do with everything, not just money. Your entire life and every facet of it, God first, trust him with the rest. So these harvests, you were trusting God. You were giving it away. I remember an illustration I, I used, one of the first sermons that I, that I preached here, and maybe you'll remember this one. And it was a story about a man who was in a desert and he was dying of thirst. And he found a pump, a well pump. And he found a cup of water. And it was a cup of water that would have quenched his thirst, but it wouldn't have been enough to save him. And there was a note there from the last person who was there. And the person said, you need to pour all the water into the pump to prime it. And then when you prime it, you'll have all the water you need. And then the note went on and said, when you're done, make sure you leave the cup full for the next person. So the person had to make the decision to trust. Okay, am, am I going to take this water, get temporary satisfaction, and hope I have enough to make it to the end? Or do I trust to pour it in and then I'll have more than I need? That's the first fruits. You give to God and trust Him for the rest. So this is what they were told to do. When you go into the land, you get the first fruits, you give to God, you set it apart. You give this dough. And what Paul does is he says that it makes the rest of it holy. Now, holy is a, an acceptable translation, except in the context, it doesn't mean holy as you normally think of the word holy. In the New Testament, we usually think of the word holy in relation to God and his sinless purity and these sorts of things. Or in relation to us, we say that we are holy because we have been made holy. Jesus Christ atoned for our sins. We have been washed by the renewing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We have been cleansed. We are now whiter than snow. That's why the scriptures calls believers saints. The Greek word is holy ones. Not innate holiness, but the holiness of God in us. So we normally think of holy in that sense. 
But the basic meaning of holy is to cut and separate, to consecrate. And that's how it's used in Numbers 15, and that's how Paul's using it here. He means to consecrate it, to set it apart for God. So Paul says concerning uh, the, the dough, he says, you set apart the first bit and it makes the rest acceptable. It doesn't make it holy in the sense of righteous and morally blameless. But it means one impacts the other. The character of the one becomes the character of the other. If one is separated, so is the other. God doesn't ask for you to give it all to him so that he can use it all. He's asking you to entrust it all to him. The first fruits through a demonstration of setting it apart. You don't get that, you give it away. But the rest of it still belongs to God and he says that part is set apart for you to use. So Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Now if the first piece of dough, that is this one, separated, consecrated, set apart for God, if that one is holy, that is set apart, so is the rest by definition. Now this may not make sense in context now, but it will. Because what he's ultimately going to say is what God promised to Israel, the first fruits, will by application extend to the rest. And it's based on God's promise, not on Israel's faithfulness. So that's the first part here, verse 16. So if the first per part of the dough is set apart, the lump is also set apart. Now, here the lump has to do with the nation of Israel. The lump is not the same part as, as, as the first bit, the first piece of dough. So you have the part in the whole. The whole is Israel. The part is the same thing as the root, and I don't want to give that away just yet. So he picks up with the second illustration, the last part of verse 16, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. He has changed metaphors by going from a piece of dough to the rest to a root and the branches that come from it. And he's saying, if one is set apart, so is the other. That's all he's saying. It's set apart to God for God. Now, the nation of Israel, did they choose God or did God choose them? God chose them. In fact, they weren't even a nation. It was a person. God chose Abram from Ur of the Chaldees and entered into a covenant with him. Remember, and it's a unilateral covenant. One way. It's unconditional. God says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and it has nothing to do with it what Abraham's going to do. Abraham doesn't have to be faithful because it's all part of the promise of God. It's a promissory covenant. I promise to do this. God swears by himself that he will do this. In fact, remember we walked through the, the, the enactment of this ceremony and God puts Abram to sleep and he doesn't even participate in it. God in theophany passes between the pieces, binding himself to the covenant, the blood covenant. So it's unilateral, it's only based on God, and it's unconditional. No conditions attached for Abram, no conditions attached for Israel. God is going to do this. And so we see Israel has rejected God. What's God going to do? It doesn't matter. God swore an oath by himself that he was going to do it no matter what. So has God cast off Israel? No, he can't. This is about his nature, his character. God cannot permanently cast them off. 
It's not in the cards. He promised to do it, and God is faithful. God is not a man that he should what? That he should lie. He can't go back on his word. So we have this piece of dough and the rest. We have the root and we have the branches. Now, the root. There are a couple of different interpretations of the root. I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, the ones that I don't think are right, but uh, many think that the root is Christ himself. There are many problems with this interpretation. One is Israel is attached to the root before Christ because they're later cut off for rejecting Christ. So the, the context makes it very clear that they are in the root long before Christ. So it can't be Christ. The reason, though, they, they, some people think it's Christ is because in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is described as the first fruits of the resurrection, so he's related to first fruits. Christ is also, twice in Isaiah, uh, referred to as the root of Jesse. So you have root language that's attached to him. So they say, well, he's the root, he's the first fruit, it must be Christ. Well, no, it doesn't fit the context whatsoever. Plus, it's not talking about people getting saved. He hasn't cut them off saying, okay, you can't have anything to do with salvation anymore. You're all going to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the reason they're cut off is because they won't believe. Not that God's making it so they can't believe. In fact, the earliest preaching in Acts, which is to the Jews, is repent. I think it's Acts chapter 3. It says that if they would repent, that God would send the times of refreshing. So God's not withholding the gospel from them. So it can't be Christ. Others think that it's referring to first converts. That is, it's referring to this Jewish remnant of Jewish believers. And the reason for that is that in Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians and in 2 Thessalonians, Paul refers to first believers as first fruits. So they say, well, this is referring to believers, and it must be because they're natural branches. It must be talking about, must be talking about the, the natural branches being Jews cut off. These other ones that are put in are, are, are believing Gentiles as some sort of remnant. Well, that doesn't work at all because the natural branches don't seem to be referring to, to Gentiles, but to, uh, um, to uh, or sorry, to Jews, but to Gentiles. And the root here, if it's Jewish believers, how are, how are Jews being yanked out of Jewish believers? That doesn't make any sense. You following me? If the root is Jewish believers, how, how were the Jewish unbelievers ever attached to them in the first part that they had to be yanked out? And then why are Gentiles believers being grafted into them? That doesn't make any sense. But people are picking this up because elsewhere, believers are referred to as the first fruits. The best interpretation is either that it's referring to Abraham himself. Some think it's the Abrahamic covenant. I don't think so. But some think that it's referring to Abraham himself or to the patriarchs, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think that that's the best interpretation. But I don't think it should be interpreted narrowly as reference to, to the Abrahamic covenant but the fact that the Abrahamic covenant was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a blessing from God. They didn't do anything to deserve it, but God blessed them with it and the fruit of it. Let me give you some quotes from some scholars that, that uh, agree with this. Frank Thielman says, Since Paul is not specific, all that can be said with confidence at this point is uh, in, the, uh, in the argument is that the root represents the rich heritage of Israel that Paul described in chapter 9, verses 4 through 5, where Paul says theirs is the covenants and, and, and theirs is the giving of the law, and he lifts all these things that are, that are theirs. 
this rich inheritance, these blessings that they, they had, but the Gentiles didn't. They were in a position of privilege and blessing. If you were raised in a godly Christian home, you were raised with privileges and blessings that somebody raised in a pagan home didn't have. You had the gospel in your home. And so they were in a position of, of privilege. Elliot Johnson says, The root is likely the patriarchal fathers from whom the nation has grown. And these blessings. Probably the best is Alva J. McLean, who says, The root. He says, It represents the place of favor or privilege. Abraham is the root. The apostles uh, the apostle is saying that because the Jews did not live up to his privileges and the light God gave him, he has been cut out and the wild branches were grafted into the place of favor. So it's not saying about who's getting saved and who's not. It said, who is God blessing and favoring? Israel rejected, God's moving, removing favor. The Gentiles are believing in faith. God's bestowing the favor, the blessing upon them. So the root is the position of the blessing, the favor of God. That place of blessing, if you're attached to it, then you are set apart. But if some of the branches were broken off, the, the, the grammar here is, is a passive tense, which means that the subject, the branches, receive the action of the verb, broken off. It's a divine passive because God is the one that breaks them off. This is not losing salvation or the ability to believe, but they are no longer in the position of privilege or blessing or favor. Remember the Romans 1 idea. They've been handed over. Or later in Romans 9, that their, their hearts have been hardened. God is removing grace and mercy and blessing that he uniquely gave them. He's not removing the gospel. Okay, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off by God, and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. He's turning his attention to the Gentiles because he's afraid that the Gentiles are going to gloat. That they're going to say, you know, kind of, you know, good for you, Jews, you're getting what you deserved. And we're now in the position of favor and blessing, and it's all good for us, all smooth sailing. They're actually in a position where they could potentially do the same thing that Israel did in the Old Testament, where they thought that God would only bless them and never judge them, that they could do whatever they wanted, and that God would just bless them. God was the genie in the lamp. They just rubbed it, and he gave them their wishes. And so he's going to warn them. He says, but you being a wild olive, wild olives were, were olives that weren't very productive at all. If you, if you want olives, you don't want a wild olive tree. You want a cultivated one. Okay? And uh, there's something interesting that happens here. So I want you to pay close attention. He says, if some of the branches were broken off by God, and you, being a wild branch, were grafted in among them, became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Um, this is interesting what God does here, because for centuries, scholars were struggling over this because nobody, they thought, would ever graft a wild olive branch into a cultivated olive tree. You wouldn't do that. But about a, a century or so ago, uh, a New Testament scholar by the name of William Ramsey, followed by a bunch of other people, decided to look into this using ancient sources. And what they found out is that if you had a cultivated olive tree that was dying, sometimes you would take healthy uh, wild branches and graft them in so that the opposite would happen. 
that the, the, um, the wild one would invigorate the tree. So you're not doing it for the olives. You're doing it to, to empower the root, the tree. So you would take this branch and you would get it, not so you get more olives because that tree, the branch is never going to give you olives the way you want, but it's going to help the tree. So if Paul is intending to do this, he's trying to bring this idea out, it, it picks up with the jealousy theme that when he brings in, it's going to be jealous. In other words, when God is saving the Gentiles and they're grafted into this, the whole thing is invigorated and eventually the, the, not only are the, the natural branches going to just continue to get healthier and healthier and thrive, but eventually pick up the jealousy theme, God's going to bring in the natural branches as well. Because if you have a tree and you just stop lopping off all the branches, eventually that's not good for the tree. But God takes these Gentile believers, grafts them in, they receive the blessings, which go all the way back to Genesis 12. And through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. God already promised this. Okay, so you become a partaker with them, that is this remnant of, of, uh, of uh, the branches. By the way, notice in verse 17 that word some. Not all of the branches were cut off. Only the unbelieving branches were cut off. So there's a remnant there. And that remnant is still the natural branches. The covenants are for Israel. Gentiles merely receive the overflow of blessings. Do not boast against the branches, that is the natural branches. But if you do boast against them, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So we had reference here to John 15. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. And it talks about abiding, remaining in him so if we're not in christ we're not drawing sustenance spiritual sustenance from him well here they're told listen don't think that because you're grafted in that makes you more important than the root than the tree the tree is the most important you receive from now it's interesting when he's telling them about he's warning them that they could find themselves in the exact same place that Israel found itself. That is, just because they've been grafted in doesn't mean they can't be cut out. And in fact, elsewhere, Paul in particular is going to talk about in the, in the eschaton, in the last days, this is exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be a great apostasy of the church the church is going to be cut out. Not believers, but the apostate church. And for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking on this theme because I believe one of the signs of the times. A lot of people have asked me over the last couple of years, do you believe, you know, that, that Jesus is coming back soon? And while the rapture of the church itself is an, is an imminent event, it could happen any time, it's a silent a signless event, there are certain things that seem to talk about that we're moving into that season. And one of the things I believe that is most poignant is the growing apostasy within the church. Now, this will come to its climax within the tribulation period because all the true believers are going to be gone. But it's already beginning now. Will God bring revival? Who knows? But the church is heading down, spiraling down into apostasy. And we'll talk about that for the next couple of weeks. But he's warning them that, you know, they could go the same way. Woe to those that go the way of Cain. They could go the way of Israel in their unbelief. Remember, Scripture talks about that, you know, take care about boasting lest ye fall. 
Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast against them, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So if we we're going to give this a positive spin, we'd say, let he who boasts, boasts in the Lord. But that's not the boasting he's talking about. He's talking about that, that uh, uh, prideful boasting. I'm in, you're not. How sick is that, by the way? It's like laughing at somebody. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. Ha ha. It's, it's just, they need to be warned because if that's their thinking, perhaps they're not truly born again. Okay, verse, uh, verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Paul's saying, quite right. Yes, but, but not because there's anything special in you apart from belief. Because he's going to talk about in the next verse why Israel was cut out. And if they do the same thing, then they'll end up with the same circumstance. Quite right. They were broken off for their what? Unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Now this is an interesting statement. Fear. Work out your salvation with what? Fear in trembling. One of the worst things that has come into the church over the last hundred years is people who think that just because they made a profession of faith, they're going to heaven. That is, that there's no accompanying works or growth or anything in their life. They just walked an aisle, raised a hand, prayed a prayer, but there's no fruit. There's nothing. Didn't James say faith without works is dead? He says, can it save you? And in the Greek, it implies, no, it cannot. He says, it's useless, it's dead, it cannot save. Now, I believe in the once saved, always saved view. I believe in eternal security. Anybody who is truly born again is secure. God keeps them. Jesus says, I know my sheep. He says, I give them eternal life. None will be lost. Okay, good enough for me. The problem is there's a lot of people who think they're Christians and they're not. And the church for a hundred years has been convincing these people that they are saved. If you're doubting your salvation, it must be the devil. Tell them to be quiet and go away. You ever think maybe it's the Holy Spirit trying to wake you up? Paul says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. He says, don't worry, if you pass the test, great. But if you fail, better to know now. Wouldn't you rather get right with God than die and find out on the other side? Uh-oh. God says, too late. Scripture uses imagery. It talks about shutting of the door and people can't get out. It picks up the imagery of the ark where the door's shut and you can hear people screaming and banging on the door, let me in. Too late. And he's warning them, faith with fear. Here is good fear. Remember, John wrote his first epistle so that you would know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know. But unfortunately, most people will never put it to the test to find out. One of the best sayings I ever read in any book, and Elaine, you'll love this, was a guy, and he starts off the book, and he's saying, most people will spend more time in their life looking over the vegetables in the supermarket then they will examining whether or not they are truly born again or not. So he warns them, faith with fear. If there is no fruit, then be concerned. And I'm not saying you had a bad week. If you've been a Christian for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or a year, is there progression? Is it going? Yes, it may be up and down, up and down, but if you draw that line, you extrapolate it out, is there growth? Is there maturity? Is there change? Is there transformation? 
And I'm not talking about some external wishy-washy religiosity thing because God warns us about that too. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. None of those, by the way, are listed in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. Not their profession, by their fruit. Okay, let's tie a bow on this. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be haughty, arrogant, proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Faith, 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 faith. How do I know that I believed? Okay, I was baptized in 1979. February of 1979. I was one month from turning um, five years old. I was baptized. After a sermon one day, which is interesting, because back then the kids sat in church and we were expected to, to listen. The pastor preached a hellfire and brimstone sermon. And... Uh, I said to my dad, I don't want to go to hell. What do I need to do to be saved? So I went and had an appointment with the pastor, and he walked me through the gospel message and led me to the Lord. And our whole family got baptized. It's actually February, not uh, 1980. So I was uh, a month from turning six. Our whole family got baptized. But how do I know it was genuine? How do I know that I believed then? And here's the simple answer. Because I'm believing today. Faith with fear. If I'm not believing today, there should be fear. Because God keeps those who are his. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word And we thank you, Lord, in this passage, this wondrous reminder of how you work in such a way that despite our unbelief, you found a way that souls would be saved. So we thank you, Lord, for mercy and for grace and for love. And we cry out with Paul in what he said in verse 33 when he said, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. And Lord, while we give you thanks and praise and we cry out with joy and thankfulness for saving our souls, Lord, keep us in the faith. Lord, may we be firmly anchored to Jesus Christ and may we cling to the cross. Be immovable, unshakable because we are holding to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.